Welcome to Mountain Strong. Today we've come to the other side of Phoenix and uh, we're just outside of Mesa, Arizona actually. I uh, stopped along the side of the road to have a look at McDowell Mountain behind us and uh, didn't realize that just around the bend from where I was was the granite, oh, I already forgot the name of it, but the granite reef or granite rock, I think, something like that. Anyway, you'll see it on the video, the uh, granite something. Uh, pull off ultimately is what it is, just a place where you can stop and have a lunch, uh, but uh, uh, a place where you can also get a closer look at this mountain and also surprisingly enough a place where there's a little bit of water uh, in front of the mountain and so it's a pretty cool scene, uh, nice place to have lunch if I had brought mine, which uh, I didn't, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, today we're going to be having a look at Psalm 149. Let's go ahead and read that together. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his Maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their King. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written. This is honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. I didn't point this out in the last psalm, but we've been seeing psalms that begin and end with a statement, praise the Lord, which again describes these psalms as psalms that encapsulate the very idea of praise. Uh, inclusios, where the psalm begins and ends with the same statement, are kind of summation statements, but also purpose statements. This is a psalm of praise. And you can see that, especially in the first five verses, can't you? You can see a description of praise. You can see in verse one, the desire to sing to the Lord a new song. I don't know if I've discussed that phrase, new song, in the Psalms yet, but you wonder, well, why are they always wanting to sing a new song? Well, you know what happens sometimes when we're singing old songs, right? Uh, sometimes we merely go through the motions and sometimes the old songs can't capture the, the emotion and the, the feeling that we have at the current moment, and so there's a desire to sing a new song to the Lord. And that desire is sprinkled throughout the Psalms and even into the New Testament. In heaven they sing a new song, remember. But as you're thinking about that new song and uh, thinking about this desire to praise, it flows into the next few verses. They're, they're going to praise Him and, and uh, praise Him because of verse 4, He takes pleasure in His people because He adorns the humble with salvation. Uh, salvation is something to truly get excited about and to praise Him in light of that. And so he says in verse 5, let the godly exult in glory, let them sing for joy on their beds. Let them be praising God while they're awake and let them be praising God even when they lie down at night. And so this idea of continual praise and surrounding one's life with praise. But then you see this really dramatic transition in verse number 6. The praise of God is in the throats of these people and yet in verse number 6 it says a two-edged sword is in their hands. And you're wondering, well, how can that be? How can these be people of praise, but at the same time, a sword in their hands? And you kind of connect that with the New Testament reality where sometimes people, you know, they, they see a, uh, a disjoint between the Old Testament and the New Testament for one, but then the idea of the Christian and conflict in the other. And, and so they, they say that there's war in the Old Testament, but none in the New Testament, that there is even in the New Testament in the life of Christ, nothing but peace. It's not being consistent really with the teachings of Jesus or the life of Jesus. You remember Jesus, he said that his teachings would bring a sword down families, let alone uh, between nations and groups of people. The Lord doesn't always bring peace. And in fact, uh, what one person one time told me that they would rather have Christ than conflict is just not consistent because sometimes Christ demands conflict. Sometimes we have to be people of conflict in order to defend the Lord and his cause. And so, I think the psalm is a good reminder to us. There are some of us who find combat and find conflict very easy. We're uh, the kind of people who crave conflict. This psalm isn't for you. But for those of us who find ourselves more drawn to humility, uh, and I don't mean that to say that the others aren't. I mean that to say that we find ourselves more drawn to the, to the more non-biblical humility where we're, we're uh, quiet and meek and mild and, and uh, just passive in every situation. This is a psalm for us to realize that conflict is a part of our lives if we are following God. It's not carnal conflict. We're not taking up literal swords as they did in the Old Testament, and so there is that difference. Um, but 
Nevertheless, we are called to conflict. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, uh, we are called uh, to, uh, to wage war, not carnally, uh, but as the verse continues there, to cast down high and lofty things. Uh, we have a great conflict that we have to wage against Satan and his forces. In John chapter 16 and verse 8, you know, the idea here that we're going to, to do as these verses say in verse 7, vengeance, conquest in verse 8, judgment in verse 9, that's the very thing that the Spirit was sent forth to do, to uh, convict the world of sin and to bring judgment to it in John 16 and verse 8. And so again, it's a part of our lives as people of faith. It's not something that we can just tear out of our Bible or something that we can ignore. It's not something that's merely a part of the Old Testament, not a part of the New. And so again, this psalm is for us and it is a reminder to us that at times we have to be people of conflict. We don't crave conflict. The servant of the Lord must not strive, Paul told Timothy. But at the same time, there are times where we merely have to and must have to uh, dig our heels in and do that which is right, even when others aren't. So go to this psalm if you need that kind of encouragement. And may God bless you today.